I'd like to start my presentation today off with a confession. I feel like I'm in a safe environment here, and, and you will welcome my confession and, 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 and greet, greet it with the respect that it's due. I do want to apologize to my family and friends that are in the crowd because they may be hearing something um, with this confession that they didn't think about me, and, and it might be a bit of a shock to them and such. But I am a foodie, and it feels really good to say that, and, and I know it'll be a surprise to you to, that I, I actually had to confess this and such, but food is at the center of my life. I, I wake up every morning thinking about food. I work all day talking to people and students and teachers about food, and I've wrapped my personal life up around food. My yard is a food-producing machine. I've got food-producing plants everywhere across the yard. We've got chickens and bees in the backyard. We have a, an outdoor kitchen and dining area where we can hold many events and do some really awesome cooking in the backyard. When my friends come over to visit me, we cook. We love to gather around food. We talk around food. We gather in the kitchen. I love teaching my friends about how to cook different kinds of foods and how to make things like pasta from scratch. And my Facebook pages are full of pictures about food, dishes that we create together, food that comes from our gardens, from our, the cooking together. And, and I love to post them and share some inspirational pictures about food. And then we gather um, on a weekly basis in our backyard for what we call Sunday dinner. And, and friends come together and we cook together and we sit down and enjoy a meal. And we really um, start the week off well, gathered around the table enjoying this meal. I like to help other people find food. I'm currently running five different CSA programs um, connecting my friends to local meat producers so that they can get um, great local meats into their meals and, and enjoy the benefits of, of our Colorado agriculture. And no one is too young to be part of my food group. My friend Charlotte comes over and helps me in the garden every day, and I'd like to you know, give her those experiences that, that I so much enjoy. But as I was preparing for my talk this, today, I was trying to think, how did I get to this point? How did I get to the point where food is such a focal point in my life? And, and I really started thinking about my early experiences around food. I remember going to visit my grandparents in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, and, and enjoying the Polish holidays with them and all the food traditions around that, and especially the peach tree that they had in their yard, anticipating arriving at the house and seeing if the peaches were ripe yet and ready for us to eat. I was responsible for the family garden back in our house. I did all the watering and the weeding and the harvesting and, and added that food to our dinner table. And, and I remember how much we enjoyed the fresh food for our meals. I remember in junior high school uh, taking home ec courses and the very first thing I ever learned how to cook was egg in a hole. And bringing that recipe home and, and, and making my family eat it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday <laughs> because that's what I knew how to cook. And then my first job uh, at 15 years old, working at the local country club. I started as a dishwasher and, and quickly advanced through every department within the kitchen. And for five years, really discovered what it means to work with other people around food and that, that camaraderie ship and, and making food that other people sit down and enjoy and, and, and that becomes memorable for them. All these memories had a huge impact on me, and that was just my childhood. I'm not going to go through the rest of my life and show you my food pictures, but I believe there is a formula to becoming a foodie, and I believe that formula starts with uh, experiences in our youth around food, uh, very rich experiences, and, and an active participation with food. Get involved with it, get active with it, touch it, feel it, do something with food. And, and all those experiences, especially as, as youth, um, allows us to gain the skills and knowledge to be comfortable with food. And we call that food literacy. The more knowledge and the more skills we have around food, the more literate we are with food, the more likely we're going to build a healthy relationship with food. And I honestly believe I do have a healthy relationship with food. I enjoy my, my junk food every now and then. But I, I also know what, what is moderation, and I also know what is the proper diet for me to feed my family and my friends. But I think kids nowadays, they're disconnected from food. Kids don't know about where food comes from. They don't know how to handle it. They're scared of things they don't recognize. And food is, is, is not the same kind of priority for them as it was when I was growing up. 
They lack the hands-on experiences with food. They lack that participation around food. And we're, we're not seeing any signs of, of food literacy amongst the kids. They have minimal food literacy. They don't understand what, what food's all about. And, and I firmly believe that this is contributing to the unhealthy relationship um, a lot of kids and then uh, you know, adults have with food that is evidenced by obesity, uh, diabetes, and, and, and heart disease that is associated with the food that we eat. So I, for the last 14 years, have been involved with a group called Slow Food. Um, the last 13 years in Denver with, a, with the local chapter there called Slow Food Denver. And we've been working with kids in public schools um, through school gardens, working on developing food literacy among kids, teaching them about the good, clean, and fair aspects of food. That, that food should be good for our bodies. It should be nourishing. It should be tasty, seasonal, and local when possible. Food should be clean. Growing the food should not impact the environment. We should respect animal welfare. And food should be fair. There should be fair access for everyone for this good food and fair wages for the farm workers and fair um, pays for the farmers when he goes sells his food. The last year, I've been part of Slow Food USA's national team based out of Brooklyn, New York, and I'm now the director of the National School Garden Program. And I am now working with 150 chapters across this country, engaging the chapters to support school gardens in their areas to engage kids in this type of learning and increasing their food literacy. And we just got a very nice um, infusion of funds from Chipotle, and it's developing a really interesting partnership for us on, on teaching kids about healthy food. But it all started for me back in this school garden. This is the school garden I started 14 years ago at my kids' elementary school back in Denver in, in the Washington Park area. And it was in this garden that I started developing my theories around how do kids make those connections with food? And how can we connect kids to food through the gardens and then extend that connection out into the community? Because food is a, a convivial act. We share food with our friends. We share food with our family. We got to share that food out in the community. So what I want to go through relatively quickly with you are five different programs that we've developed through the school gardens that have connected kids to their, uh, to their food first and then to their community. And then I'm going to show you evidence that the kids are uh, actually having an impact on the types of food and the food culture that's happening in, in these large school districts. So most of this work I'm going to show you is with Denver Public Schools that I've been working with for the last 14 years, but there'll be examples from other school districts too. It all starts with garden education. We've got to teach the kids how to grow the food first. And, and it's important that, that kids become active in this process because they then will gain the skills to grow their own food. It starts in the classroom in February when we're planting seeds in pots and getting the, the seedlings ready that's going to go out in the garden. They learn to transplant these plants over a couple of successions as they get bigger and bigger. And then when the soils are warm in May and the plants are ready, we're outside planting with the kids in the garden beds. And they're learning how to care for these plants in the soil and what it takes to grow this kind of food. And then when they come back to school in the fall, all this food is ready and the magic really begins. And the kids are, are discovering, where is the food on these plants? I mean, you got this huge corn stalk where is the food on the plant? And so we go through and we show them where the food is located and what does the food look like when it's ready to be picked? What does it mean to be ripe? And it could be corn, it could be plums coming off of a tree, or it could be pieces of a basil plant that's going back into the classroom. The first thing that they learn is that they can actually, with their own talents and their own skills, is grow food. And that's a very powerful lesson. Then we take that food into the classroom and, and in classes that we call taste education, where we want to develop the kids' palates around this fresh food. And, and we're going to give them some basic skills so they learn how to feed themselves. There's nothing more important to somebody when you know how to feed yourself. Then you don't have to be dependent on somebody else. Again, if we're looking at the basil, we're looking at that plant and the pieces of the plant that the kids brought in the classroom. Where is the food on this plant? What do we have to do to get it ready and, and what kind of tools can we use to make things like pesto? And then mix that pesto up with pasta or spread it on bread and enjoy that with our friends. And so I'd love to show you a lot of more pictures on taste education, but we're going to move on to uh, a, a, another program in which the kids have the ability to feed their friends in the cafeteria. And the Garden and Cafeteria program, which is now in its fifth year in Denver, allows kids to grow food and harvest food using very good food safety protocols 
and bring that food into the cafeteria where they weigh it and measure it and log it onto some invoices so that they can um, sell it to the kitchen manager. And then the kitchen manager takes that food into the kitchen and using some skills that we've trained them with on handling fresh food, they prepare that food to be on the salad bars. And the kids get to make those selections. So not only did they grow the food that's coming onto the salad bar, but they get to choose that food for themselves. And that's a powerful act for a, a five-year-old to be able to choose the food to put it on their plate that they want to eat. And we let the kids know what's coming off of their gardens because we put signs up on the, sal up on the salad bars informing them that the cherry tomatoes and those cucumbers are from your school garden. Extending the garden even further into the community, we have programs that allow the food to get out past the schoolyard. We call them youth farmer's markets. And these are single vendor farmer's markets that the kids set up right on school grounds one afternoon a week. And they get this farmer's market set up so that when the bell rings, all the families are coming together and they're buying this food from them. And the proceeds from the farmer's market goes back to the garden program to sustain the program for, for next year. And these markets have worked well in very comfortable neighborhoods, and they've worked well in neighborhoods that are classified as food deserts. They don't have grocery stores in these neighborhoods, and our farmer's markets becomes that fresh food supply for eight weeks in September and October. And the kids play all different roles for the farmer's markets. They get to be sales. They get to do marketing. They'll do the harvesting, the cleanup, and the money handling. It's really building a, business, a small business with the kids, and, and they're learning those skills. And then finally, our last program is understanding why are there hungry people in our community? What does it mean to be hungry and, and why are there hungry people? And so Produce for Pantries allows kids to grow extra food in their gardens and harvest that and record it. And then the program connects them to the local food pantries so they can share that food with families that don't have access to this food. And it's a very powerful message when a, when a youngster can grow food to feed somebody else's family. So... All these programs are coming together out of the school gardens, and really, I try to design them to give the kids these rich experiences with food, like I had when I was growing up, not necessarily in the schools, but you know, in my life around uh, as, as a young person, but now we're bringing this to the schools and giving lots of kids the experience with, with food and making them active participants in the food process. They're learning how to grow, and they're learning how to feed not only themselves, but their friends, their community, and people they may never ever meet, but they want to understand the issues around hunger. And all these experiences are contributing to that knowledge and skills that kids need to be comfortable with food. So we're seeing an increase in their food literacy, their understanding of what food means through the school gardens. But for me, the really exciting part of this is that the learning and the impact of these gardens are expanding even beyond the kids themselves. And we're seeing uh, uh, effects of these programs at the home environment, too. Um, we're seeing families getting into starting their own gardens, going to farmer's markets, cooking together. They're calling me on the phone asking for that recipe about beets that I fed their kid the other day and such. So we're seeing, we're seeing changes at home. We're seeing the, the involvement of parents coming back to school to help out in the garden programs. And we're seeing community members like church groups and Boy Scout troops helping out in the gardens because they see the value. So the increased excitement that the kids generate around the gardens are bringing other people to the gardens, and that's really exciting. And then the, the districts themselves are actually recognizing all this involvement by the kids and the parents, and they're actually changing things at the district level that are impacting the food culture for schools. And we're seeing changes in policy, so we can do things like local procurement, or sometimes called farm to school, where local farmers are supplying produce to the school cafeterias to feed the kids and keep that money within the community. This is a picture from Weld County up in, um, up in Greeley. They bought 350 dozen ears of corn to feed the kids up there, but they needed help shucking the corn because that's very labor intensive. And so they hired the soccer team to shuck the corn. And the soccer team then got funds for their new uniforms and such. Very innovative way to bring that local food and involve the kids in the process. They'll never forget that experience. We're, we're seeing programs like Scratch Cooking happening in Denver Public Schools, where I help train over 650 staff on how to follow a recipe, how to handle raw fruits and vegetables and raw meat, how to bake bread, how to make soups. And we're at the point now where 90% of the food in Denver Public Schools is made from scratch in the kitchens, including bread every day.
We're seeing salad bars opening up in every school in the district and where the kids are making their own selections and, and as you saw earlier, some of the food coming from school gardens. And we're seeing school farms opening up now. Denver Public Schools, like many school districts, own lots of extra land. And that land usually lays fallow and may require some watering and some care, so there's, there's an expense to it. We had now have three and a half acres under production in Denver Public Schools growing organic vegetables for the school cafeterias. And we have plans on expanding that up to close to 20 acres to, to try to feed the entire district off of the land that we already own. We have school greenhouses, like here in District 11 in Colorado Springs over Galileo Middle School, where they're growing lettuce and herbs to add to the good food program that, that is happening here in Colorado Springs. All these efforts, the school gardens, the school farms, and the school greenhouses are bringing organic produce to school kitchens for the very first time. Food service directors don't have the budget to buy organic produce through the regular channels, but if we grow it ourselves, we're finding ways to, to bring that food into the kitchens and, and improving the overall quality of the meals. And all this is really producing some great school lunches for the kids. New recipes, using fresh ingredients, no more just cutting open a bag and throwing it in the freezer, but we're actually cooking now in, in schools. All this is because of school garden programs, and I'll be a little selfish, I will take the credit for that, but if it wasn't for the kids' excitement in the gardens and that excitement going home and their parents coming back and saying, thank you, Mr. Principal or Ms. Principal for these garden programs and that message getting it back up to the district, I believe we wouldn't be seeing all these changes that we're already seeing in the school food culture. The gardens lead to increased food literacy, which the district recognizes, and they're willing to invest more money in the infrastructure, and we're building a healthier food culture. And we all know that a healthy food culture will lead to great academic performance by the kids because they're, we're nourishing their mind as well as their bodies at the same time. And so I want to leave you with a vision on a project that's coming up. We're, we're talking to school districts to, to actually get involved in very large-scale um, production of food. We're talking about a five-acre greenhouse somewhere up in Denver where it's going to grow enough food for the district, for every other district in the state, as well as feeding the community. Because school districts have land, they have infrastructure, and they can get loans to do this kind of thing. And, and it's really a unique trifecta that we're going to try to put in effect and, and I'm going to finish off my last couple seconds here saying that my vision for school food is that the schools become the center of nutrition for, for the community, where kids are not only being fed great meals, but families can gather for food, whether it's meals or by purchasing the food, and then that food gets out into the community to nourish the whole community. Thank you.